Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. So I'm on their website right now, blackriflecoffee.com. And the first thing that came up are two brand new ready to drink flavors. You have vanilla bomb and salted caramel. Now one of these is a 300 milligram triple shot. Let me just tell you, I'm still on the road right now completing the 777 expedition. We got one more stop to go. And I've been using these heaters occasionally to give me that little bump in performance. And actually, it's not even in performance. It's a bump in attention. If that's not your jam, well, don't worry about it. You can choose from coffee clubs. You can choose from subscriptions, whether that be of coffee, merchandise, stickers, you name it. They have what you need. You can get individual bags of coffee. You could hook up your friends. You could get a coffee mug, whatever it may be. So if you want to support an amazing brand founded by amazing people, two of which are on this trip with me. We've got two Black Rifle employees who are putting their money where their mouth is. Go to blackriflecoffee.com and support. And that's it on the business side of the house. My guest today is a member of the 777 Expedition team. He's our lone Canadian. And every once in a while, I call him maple syrup. And he doesn't seem to mind, which sucks because nicknames should never be picked by yourself. And they should always have some type of negative connotation. Even though I love maple syrup, but I find it's delicious. Who's Glenn, though? Glenn spent nearly 20 years in the Canadian military, most of that time in a special operations capacity. He spent a good amount of time at Joint Task Force 2, also known as JTF2, and I just recommend Googling that yourself. But post-military is where I find it getting really interesting. I'm going to call him an entrepreneur. And specifically, he founded... One Nine Investments, while serving as an assault officer in the Canadian Special Operations Forces, which I've said many times, I think is a fantastic idea for people to do while they're in. Lift your head up and look at the horizon. But what he's doing now, I find to be incredibly interesting, just because I don't know much about it. And he does a way better job of explaining it than I do. So here's another podcast. I hope you guys enjoy the green screen. Episode number 268 with Glenn Cowan. Enjoy. Like you can't really train for it, you know, like no matter how many times you get kicked in the nuts, the actual time you get kicked in the nuts, it's still going to hurt. I agree. Um, but cold, I would start saying I start bitching about the cold at about minus 15 Celsius. So 15 below. Where do they converge and they're the same? I don't know. It's like negative 50? Yeah, it's cold. What's negative 15 Celsius in Fahrenheit? It, I don't know. I don't know. Cool, like probably 5, 10. Okay. I was thinking you were going to say far into the negatives, like the sub-zeros. It's pretty sub. That's pretty cold. Like, and cold bugs me when it impacts my life. Like when I have to like start my car for 15 minutes before I get in it or... Do you guys have to plug them in in the winter times? Not in Ontario where I live. In Edmonton, you plug your cars in. So they will have, seize, right? If it you will, don't. yeah. So every parking spot has a, a plug and you got your block heater and, and that's, that's real. But it gets really cold there. Like it was about minus 40 Celsius out west all over Christmas. But that's saying, unseasonably cold. Like are that's, you saying public parking spots have plug-ins too? Everywhere. Really? Everywhere. Okay. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Otherwise oh, you'd never leave your house. Right. But it's a better cold out there. And this is where cold is like, well, you, 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 in the Eastern Canada, people are like, well, it's a wet cold. So it gets right through to your bones. It's, it's a like, dry heat. It's fuck. It's cold. Cold is cold. <laughs> like, I, all I know is I do have a cold plunge and I have to heat my cold plunge. So... You know, it's... I feel like that's an excessive purchase. You could just go outside. You could. It's, I mean, it's not an excessive... I mean, it's a 170 liter gallon... No, 170 gallon cow trough. Like, it's not like Sorelli's fancy boy cold plunge. It's just a piece of galvanized metal full of water. I'm going home to one of those fancy cold <sighs> plunges. I, I would do it too. <laughs> I, I, did, you, did you get the hookup from the guy? No. Oh. If by hookup you mean full retail off the internet, I totally <laughs> did. Um yeah, the must be nice. Must be nice to have one of those. But like, yeah. Like, yeah, it was nice to go onto the internet and pull my credit card out and then pay for it yeah. in its entirety. <laughs> but that guy, that that guy that was here with the SpaceX crew, 
he was like a rep for one of the cold plunge companies. And when he was saw, he really? yeah. So when Mike in the drop zone Everest video, when Mike was, uh, like talking about his hot cold, he actually that, showed the plunge. He showed the plunge yeah. and that, and it was that same company and that dude that, that, uh, Tyler, no, like the, the Instagram dude, De- uh, Devin. Yes. So he's like a rep for that company and he okay. got super excited about it and couldn't stop and was talking about the plunges. I know people, a few people that have one and they, they seem to be really nice. They're it's good. got the full filtration. I guess it circulates very often. The fil- It was the same thing when I found out about the, what are those tanks? Uh, not a zero gravity tank, an isolation tank. Float, float tanks. My first thought, I'm like, this is disgusting. And then uh. you find out about the filtration system. And first time I ever tried one of those actually was in Vancouver. Oh, yeah? I was up there doing some uh, technical advising stuff. I think from a guy from your old community. Okay. He was the armorer. Okay. On set, which would make sense because it was being shot in Canada. Probably yeah. easier for them to source uh, weapons. But it was a retail f- facility where you'd go rent the time in it. Oh, cool. It was... It, it kind of feels greasy, though. Like, it's like heavy, well, it's thick. Well, because there's so much salt. Yeah, but then when you think about everyone else in it... I did a lot of research, though, about the filtration. Come out with, like, some fungus? I think I think that they would be shut down really fast if that you'd, happened. You'd think so. Yeah. I, what I'm not looking forward to with the cold plunge, for me, it's completely mental. It's I, hard. I despise being... Like, being cold, I can deal with. Being wet, I can deal with. I despise the combination of the two of them. So, for me, if I... Like, I can sit in mine for a while if my hands and feet are out of the water. I can go totally neck deep. The second I put my hands and feet in, it's like a circuit completes, and it's, like, fucking painful. Interesting. Yeah. it's As long as there's something out, I find it's okay. I mean, it's not pleasant by any stretch, but... Do you dunk your head? I do. When you get in full submersion and then full you leave it Full submersion, then I leave it out. Jerk, yeah. we were talking about cold plunges at one of the meals the other day, and... Jericho was like, yeah, I just go lay down in the snowbank in Salt Lake City. Well, it's not, not the same. I don't think it is the same either, but I appreciate the, the enthusiasm. Because I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to do is go lay, lay down, down in the, the snowbank. Yeah. How, uh, how did you become a, a member of this merry band of misfits? Mr. Sorelli. How did you guys meet? We met at a bar in Ottawa, which is my hometown, or my where I live now with my family, on Remembrance Day. And Mike was in his community, we were in our community, and, and the subunits within those communities were very close. We did, a lot of, we did a lot of stuff with Mike's sub element from his community. Mike did some time with an army unit. Yep. Uh, while he was in that army unit, we had a guy there as well. And so they became friends, and then Mike came to Ottawa. And we hit it off, and it's actually a fucking hilarious story. I told it on his podcast. But I don't know if you've heard this, but I'll, I'll tell it very quickly. Uh, we got in a big bar fight. Not me and Mike, but there was like a rash of stolen valor in Canada. I remember Canada. you referencing a trident getting ripped off. Is this this night? It's the, they ripped off all his ribbons, and then he was so mad that he, he's like, he took his trident off. He's like, you want my fucking trident, motherfucker? And he used it as a ninja star. And he threw it at these guys. So what had happened was... I was going to say, you got to back up. Where okay. is this, what's going on with the stolen valor? Okay, so like legit stolen valor. Uh, like in the bar you're in or just like in general? leading up to that Remembrance Day. Okay. So November 11th, Remembrance, Remembrance Day. Day is your, is Cana- uh, Canada, Canada's... Can- Canada's like... Veterans Day. Veterans like, or Day. Or Memorial Day. It's more of a Memorial okay. Day. We don't have a Veterans Day. So it's kind of both. So it's obviously mostly about armistice from World War I... World War II, but with the war of the last 20 years, it's kind of, we have this new generation of veterans. It's a, it's, it's kind of got a pretty powerful resurgence in the way we celebrate. And it's, it's quite a, you should come this year. It's really fun in the sense that like, it's a powerful ceremony. So we were downtown right at our national war memorial and my old unit would kind of take over this pub right on the corner, get in out of the cold as soon as sort of the 21 gun salute is done. And you know, the last post is played, we kind of, you know, fuck off inside the bar and, and have a Guinness or start drinking. And it's usually a pretty long day of drinking. Um, and Mike was in town for it. And, and the guy, <laughs> the guys told Mike to wear his uniform. So Mike shows up in like Navy dress blues. He looked, he looked amazing. He looked super sharp. 
Um, we don't really wear uniforms a lot. Some guys were in a uniform, some weren't. Were they fucking with him by saying you should wear a uniform? Uh, not really. And and if they were, <laughs> <laughs> if they were, like, it's not a good way to fuck with them because it's, like, actually pretty cool. Yeah. But, you know, guys, have, I find now guys have started wearing their uniforms on that day a little more. Like, it's taken pretty seriously, but at the same time, it's like, you know, once the ceremony's done, it's kind of like let your hair down a bit. Anyway, long story short, leading up to this, there had been a ton of stor- stolen valors. Like guys like creating uniforms and walking around Ottawa and like being called out in social media and like completely like fictitious medals. And you know, you're talking about stuff that's probably making the news. It's, it's totally making the news. So there's like stolen valor that year with, that Mike came up was very topical. And you know, it's like at a wedding. The longer you drink, if you're in something formal, the more stuff comes off. Yeah. So by four or five o'clock in the afternoon, we're probably 10 or 12 pints into the day. If you are wearing a uniform, jackets off, ties loosened, yeah. all the, anyway, so his, no one recognized his uniform. Um, it, it, and, and you guys get medals for doing push-ups. So he has like not, a, it's not a, a, a fucking squats. squats. He's got like a fucking rack of medals. I call it a war salad. It is a war. Yeah, it is. It's like, you know, we're lucky if you get something in Canada. It's like, um, anyway, the, we, we partied at this bar and then we went over to the, the Legion, like the VA. And Mike was talking to a girl and there were some reserve soldiers there. Uh, Canada's got a really active militia, not like you're kind of like yep. Michigan militia, but like different meaning. I get it. Like primary, primary reserves is like a militia and these units have really proud heritages. And there were some pretty drunk reserve soldiers who again you know take the day pretty seriously and and so they <laughs> they like completely surrounded mike and accosted him and started calling him out for stolen valor so they're like you're a fucking poser what is this shit you're wearing you fucking making up your own uniforms they're pushing them <laughs> and you can just see like the, the compute going on in his head he's like i'm, I'm a fucking navy seal Did he like start doing what mike does he's he, like he, he he's he's like just starts posturing and it's the head twist. I know like, I'm getting under his skin when he's he'll start he'll, he'll like the left right left right. So you could see it not computing, and then he starts fighting back. It turns into a giant scuffle. It ends up like going down the stairs. His ribbons get ripped off, and as they're like coming at him, he's like, "You want my shit, motherfuckers!" He pulls off his trident and he's just like, whew, like uses it as like a ninja star. Anyway, his trident went missing. So the next day, the next day we went down there, a couple of the guys in my unit knew who these guys were and kind of said, you guys kind of overstepped. And Poor choice, gentlemen. They felt, they felt really bad. Like, I think I know who a couple of them are now by name. I think they felt pretty bad. So I think they, you know, kind of apologized. Anyway, we went and we recovered Mike's Trident and it's now under glass alongside some war uh, awards in a rightfully honored spot is Mike's trident proudly, well, proudly hung from the Remembrance Day, uh, the Remembrance Day operation. He's lucky he got it back fight. because if you guys hadn't recovered it, he would have had to spend <laughs> at least three dollars at any Navy exchange or two fifty on the internet to get another one. Can you just buy them in a yes. Navy exchange? You yep. must have a lot of people just buy them randomly. Um. You know, I bet a lot of people buy them randomly, but I don't think it's for the intention of wearing them. Got it. I, you know, the Navy Exchange, and for people who don't know what that is, it's, it's on Navy bases, they, you know, they try to have almost everything that you would need. So you don't actually have to go off base. Like they have a grocery store at a lot of places and the exchange is basically, I'm going to call it a Walmart. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like of the a PX. Var- a PX. Yeah. yeah. Because of the r- variety of things that they sell. And you know, uniforms are part of military service, so they have, you know, they have every officer and enlisted uniform that you could need depending on the season. They have the rank insignia and they have the warfare devices. I mean, you could I mean, not, I would, th- not, I would not only, think that that's com- like a little bit sacred though. Th- I mean, the one that you get issued the first time is definitely very sacred. Ten years later, I guess. I mean, like, and so, I, and I, I that one means a lot to me. But then, you end up needing, a, you have a dress white and a dress blue. Yeah. And then 
you know, depending on what your rank is, like if you are uh, a chief or above or you're an officer, you're going to have a working uniform with khakis if you need to go something that's beyond. See, like, I, I didn't realize you guys had a dress blue until he showed up in that. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, I wore mine like maybe three or four times. I thought you guys were just like a few good men in the white stuff. That the is white. in the summer. Ah. Um, oh, so it's seasonal. It is seasonal. I didn't know that. It's 100% seasonal. Wintertime is blue, summertime is white. Didn't know that. But you end up with a, a small section of your locker is full of uniforms. And, you know, there's, there's supposed to be an amount of, like, so your jump wings go just below the a quarter of an inch, yep. below the uh, left, breast, left breast pocket, then your war salad or ribbon rack, then your warfare pin. And it actually takes a little bit of time if you're going to do it properly. So what most people do is they have three complete sets. Got it. A blue, a white, and a working. And so you don't have to, like, swap so them So you don't around. have to swap it. So it, by, like, 10 years into your career, you've, you've bought some tridents because you need to do that stuff. And honestly, the the allure of it or the luster is has worn itself off but i tell you what before you have earned that i I distinctly remember you know the day leading up to it the ceremony itself the kind of reception from the boys yeah it was not blessed by the uh commanding officer but at the same time he was very aware of what was happening yeah um that one meant a lot and that has always meant a lot but everything beyond that yeah i could see from an outside perspective where you know you wouldn't want to let people buy that stuff but I think a lot of people just kind of buy it. And then, first off, anybody you see wearing a trident, like, out in town is, is suspect. Incredibly well, this, suspect. this to the whole Stolen Valor thing. Yeah. So going back to your question on how do I, how, why am I sitting here, uh, after that day, Mike, who's now affectionately known in our community as Magic Mike, yeah. um, uh, we just kind of hit it off and became friends and, kept, and stayed in touch. Uh, we both left the communities around the same time. We got building businesses kind of together, going to, you know, bouncing ideas off each other on sort of an entrepreneurial journey. And then I was going to go to Everest with him last year, but I had a conflict and I ended up going elk hunting instead. So, uh, that's not a bad second. It was not a bad second. Did you get a bull? I got a big mule deer. That's not bad. I'm not a hunter. It was my first time. Uh, I'm going to start becoming a hunter. Uh, it was a big, it was a big buck mule deer. Um, and, and I have a theory about hunting now as the non hunter, I went out with a, another, you know, a, a, a long retired seal team six guy, good buddy of mine who runs a, a venture capital fund in the U S he's a business partner, um, owns this elk ranch in Santa Fe, New Mexico with my dear friend and current business partner. And, and we, I'm like, look, I've never gone hunting you're a really experienced hunter. Like teach me everything. Like I'll do whatever you need me to do, putting urine on and shit. And, and we went out and we just started stalking and it might've been fucking with you on the urine. <laughs> no, it was my own urine. That's reasonable. No. <laughs> I mean that, yeah, that's, that's appropriate. No. <laughs> so we stalked, I was fucking quiet, like totally trying to do everything legit and right. We didn't see a thing. The last morning uh, that we were out, the, the morning I shot my 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 buck, um, we walked in loud on white light, guns slung, like fucking smoking and joking. As soon as we got into our hide, three elk scattered. It was still dark. And then we just saw tons of, of like deer. And I was, I was like, I think when you're in like kill mode, animals sense it. Like if you're like... Keep in mind, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. But like, you might be like putting out like a pheromone or like, like super kill mode. And I think they can sense it. Cause when we went in as like non-threatening, they were everywhere. The second, like we went into like hunt mode, we didn't see shit. I, you, there might be some aspect of that is correct. Um, I have not been hunting that long. I think it's been four or five years at this point. I think what surprised me as I have spent more time out hunting and had more animal interactions, when I first started, I remember the very first trip I went with Dudley, I was trying to, every step, it was exhausting actually. It was like those last few hundred yards before you get to a compound wall, right? You're trying to be super sneaky. You want to have the tactical advantage. And the more I was around animals, I was surprised. Like if you, if you're able to go and sit and watch elk or get on a mountainside that they're on, they're noisy as fuck. Yeah. They make more noise and they'll tolerate more noise than you think. I think when we try to be sneaky, you end up moving in a way that I think draws more attention than just the noise. Like 
I remember the first time I went hunting, I stepped on a stick. I'm like, that's it. Yeah. There's no animal They're within done. 50 kilometers. We have to get out of here. And then when we actually got around elk, I, there was one time up, actually up in Alberta, I ended up sneaking my way into one of their bedding areas. Yeah. When they were in there? Oh, there was like five or six bulls screaming at each other, raking trees. Oh, wow. You could have had a DJ playing a set, and I don't think they would have cared. But I do think, you know, when you're making that, like, like a little sneaky movement, which we're not trying to defeat human eyes at that time, we're trying to be quiet. Yeah. I think they, I think they see it, and they don't like it. Like, who's this fucking idiot? But I also have no idea. <laughs> I, that's where, I, that's where yeah. I land, though. I think it's more there. No, but I'd, I'd like to get, I'd like to go again. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was good. I was with Alex Coons, who okay. yeah, is frog, fro- frog fuel. He was the, he's a, he's a big hunter. So he, you know, when we shot a couple of, like he was walking me through, you know, quartering and field yeah. dressing and it was, I, I learned a ton. It was super, it was, it was, it was good. Yeah. We'll go again. And this time we'll jump in. Check the regulations. Many states will make Give you, you wait, wait 24 hours. That's fine. Because as, as with every regulation, there's a story, if not multiple behind them. Don't eat explosives. Don't. Yeah. Don't. Yeah, man. Yeah. But I, th- I have heard stories of people getting up in the air and, and either spotting for herds or tr- actually trying to push herds. Yeah, that makes sense. From p- private to public. Then they want to land and go shoot it. So Yeah, that, that would make sense. Because I've looked at doing a jump into both Idaho, Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming, and it was the same thing. We could, in fact, jump in, but you would need to wait 24 hours before you would be able to hunt, which I, I can respect that. Yeah. Um, how'd you find your way into the military? Uh... It's, I think it's probably like pretty similar to lots of guys. It's just kind of like in your DNA from a young age. Like all I I did growing up was I just wanted to play guns. My, my friends called me combat boy and I grew up in the summers at the cottage in the woods and me and my brother and buddies would just go out and like sneak around the woods and hide from cars and like pretend we're spying, doing little reckies on. Um, and then really like a powerful event when I was about 15 or 16, I did, I did a summer in Normandy in France and I did a battlefield tour. I lived with another family over there. Like an exchange trip? Yeah, kind of an exchange, but I, I, I was just captivated by the, the beaches at Normandy. And is it as powerful as they say? It is. I have that on my bucket list of something that I, I have to go see before I die. And I can remember, uh, it's kind of funny. I was chatting with Jericho about it cause he's second Rangers and like you go to Point Hawk and that's where like the Rangers, you know, scaled the cliffs and oh, the, um, I love the Canadian military history, obviously, but the American, the American museum there, the cemetery at Omaha beach, like it is like overwhelmingly powerful. And so I kind of said then, I didn't like, it wasn't like a big declaration, but in my head, I was like, if something like that ever happens in our generation, I don't want to miss it. What age were you when you were in Normandy? 15, okay. six, like probably grade 10, grade nine or 10. So formidable age. Yeah. Like still malleable at that point. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, I went to university to play football in Montreal. Uh, Let's clarify by um, that. Do you mean soccer, rugby or American rules football? American football. Okay. But it's not American football. It's Canadian football. Bigger balls, because obviously we have bigger balls. Um, yeah, just, I think that I think lends more a, to shittier hand-eye coordination. You know what? It's three down football. So What? Yeah, it's three downs. Um, so it's a, it's a huge passing game, and it's a huge special teams game. It's actually, you get some, like, um, you get an amazing passing game going. What's, like, some get, average scores? High scores. But here's the other thing. You can also, like, win by a point, because if you kick it through the end zone, you get a point. So if you punt it and it goes at the end of the end zone, you get a rouge. It's called a rouge. This is a very weird combination of American football and rugby. It's it it's American football, except there's like some really like just some nuanced rule sets. But it's American football. No, it's not. We don't have any rouges. You don't have a rouge, and the rouge is hilarious because you can fucking win by one point. Like, and it happens quite often. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so it's like really like that special teams component in the game is really uh, like really strategic. Anyway, long story short, I got there and I didn't want to play football. Um, I was like, I'm not very good at football. Like, I'm good. Uh, my friends were all playing football, so it's you know it wasn't like I was still hanging out with those guys, and I, I was like, but I need to. I still need to be in a contact sport. So I joined one of these militia units. It was right down the street. It was called the Black Watch. Uh, it was a Highland unit. So, you know, aligned with the Black Watch in Scotland. 
um, huge long lineage and history in all the wars. Um, you know, huge pipes and drums band, full Highland kilt dress. Um, like our, that unit's the one you see in the World War One pictures where guys are in the trenches wearing kilts. Um, and I, I did that. I did that for three years while I was at school. Um, and and I that just, was a, there's no like connection th- to the actual federal government. No, it's no, it's local- it's it's a full on part of the army. It, so you went so, through boot camp? Yeah, yeah. Like while I'm doing this, I'm going through boot camp. It, it's like um, it's like a citizen militia. So, so you do boot camp sequentially or you break it up into chunks? I broke it up in the summers. Okay. But again, I went in as an officer, which, yeah. you know, it's part of maybe another discussion. Well, the military needs those too. We do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of good and bad. I kind of sometimes regret it. Sometimes I wish often I was enlisted, certainly in my former probably shortened your uh, operational career. It, it did big time. Yeah. Although I had a pretty good operational career. Anyway, uh, summers at boot camp, um, kind of, it's kind of like a, a mix between like an ROTC and a West Point, but at a civilian university, but part of this like really cool unit with its own like culture and heritage and stuff like that. Huh. It's, it's the Canadian military systems built off the British regimental system. Okay. So, you know, just think of different regiments uh, and, and the idea was that, you know, in time of war, you mobilize the militia, you have this core, core group of, you know, uh, part-time soldiers that then mobilize. And, and that's actually who did all our fighting in the first and second world war was we mobilized the country, mobilized these militia regiments and then fielded, uh, fielded the militia regiments. By the end of university, I, I, I fell in love with it. It was a light infantry unit. I just fell in love with being a soldier and said, uh, I'm going to do this full time. But I fucking hated the military at the same time. It's not uncommon. And and so right away it was like, I don't want to be a career army guy. I'm like, I want to be in a special operations unit. Our our unit or, or our country at that time really only had the one unit, which is our tier one unit. The command has since grown post 9-11 substantially. What does the special operations community look like in Canada, though? outside of the unit. I mean, there have to be some, right? To a degree that are feeding into the tier one unit. Yeah. So it's a, it, the, the, the tier one unit in Canada is a joint force. So it draws Canada's small, right? So it draws from all branches, not from a land, perspective. not from a land perspective, but from <laughs> the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> so the, the, you know, up until, up until 2006, from 1993 to 2006, that unit, uh, took over sort of federal counterterrorism responsibilities from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, our federal police force. Oh, that's right. I forgot that you guys are not limited by Passe Comitatus. We're not limited by Passe Comitatus. So we do have a, a pretty robust domestic mandate. Um, now, that gets enacted at the request of the two ministers speaking. So again, in Canada, it's a British system. We have a Westminster system of parliament. So every minister is responsive, kind of like a secretary of state. It would be basically like... Uh, Homeland Security asking Department of Defense for support. Okay. Because for whatever reason, something has outstripped capacity. Make sense? Makes sense, yeah. Um, but, but the military does have that remit, and that came through at that time, the Special Operations Unit uh, called Joint Task Force 2. Um, Why two instead of one? Just a nomenclature. I don't know, we could probably make up some good story just for it. one, right? We're just skipping the one. I mean, I like the SEAL teams. We'll just start with one and then two and keep it <laughs> common keep it sensical. Going an odd even. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 2006, the uh, command started to grow uh, and, and a new uh, unit was formed called Canadian Special Operations Regiment. Um, and then we had another sort of national mission unit called the Combined Joint Incident Response Unit, which was pretty heavy focused on CBRN. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a pretty checked out unit from uh, from the rego- from the perspective of of uh, dealing with that specific shitty environment. You're talking chem, bio, yeah, chem, bio, it's radiological, yeah. Pretty pretty advanced capability they have. Uh, th- both of those units could do unilateral missions as a unit, but basically, the way that the command started to form its force force employment concepts was basically like depending on the task standalone task force would be generated depending on the mandate and the mission a unit would take lead and then you know would would force generate whatever it needed nine times out of ten sort of certainly in the early days that was my former unit would probably see to those missions and then we would draw from the community based on what we needed and it's we're not 
it's just, it, it actually works really well based on the size. Um, so yeah, it's, it's grown. We have a, uh, helicopter aviation squadron. Oh, nice. We have a training center now. So I think there's five units that kind of under the command and control of a operational level headquarters led by a two star. Um, what was a, your pathway to get there? I, I just direct. I just, uh, really? yeah. So, oh, sorry. I, no, I came out of McGill. No, great question. I, I left university yeah. at nine 11. So I got stuck in Toronto. I was flying from the, you know, the last sort of getting my commission and coming out of my basic. I got posted to a, a, a light infantry battalion called three princess, third battalion, princess Patricia's Canadian light infantry. It's in Edmonton. They really should lengthen that out. They should. You know, oh, it's a few fun. more words. Dude, this is, this is a cool, the history of this, reg, <laughs> the history of this regiment is amazing. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I'll probably butcher it if we get into it. Anyway, um, at that time, it was a light infantry battalion. Um, and that battalion was NATO's or Canada's uh, response to a NATO high readiness task force. I got stuck in Toronto because 9-11 happened. Um, ended up being late reporting in for my first platoon. Uh, and literally, like very shortly thereafter, we got a warning order for deployment into Afghanistan. So we deployed on what was what we called Op Apollo. It was Roto Zero into Afghanistan post 9-11, uh, and we hit the ground in January 2002. And we were actually attached, that battalion was cut to 101st Airborne Combat Brigade Group. So we were like the 4th Battalion, I'm going to butcher this, in the 1st of the 187 Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne. You could have either butchered that or 100% correct. I have no idea. And yeah, we went to Kandahar. We were there for seven months. Um, <laughs> and, uh, bless you. Uh, and there, that was like the defining moment of one of my best friends, my now best friends, who's a sergeant major in my old old unit, blew by me on a dirt bike one day. Fuck, I'm like, Fuck you. As we were like walking down the runway, fully like all our shit. And I'm like, if I'm going to spend my time fighting war, it's, it's going to be like that guy. And then we had a really fortuitous kind of turn of events. Um, we got a task to do security. So we did Op Anaconda, the tail end of Op Anaconda. We were in the Shaikot Valley kind of sweeping, um, the sweeping up and mopping up from Anaconda. We did a bunch of other joint ops. Uh, and then we got uh, a task to have one of our companies provide just like DNS security to Fob Chapman, which was the the, the early days of the coast outpost. Yep. Yeah. I've been there um, times. It was a dirt runway and two, two dirt huts. That was it. And, and there was some JSOC elements there. There was some intelligence community elements there. There was a British element there. Um, and so we got a task to go out and just kind of do gate guard and perimeter security and give these guys freedom of maneuver to operate out coast and the frontier. And um, so we were going out to zero our guns that night. Uh, the company that got the task, my buddy came to me. He's like, Hey, we got to, we actually have a real task. We're not just, you know, we we're, it was a lot of like this sitting around. There's a lot of sitting around on that deployment. Um, so they took the range and a company went out and, uh, they got, they got a 500 pound GBU dropped on them from an F 16 and decimated a platoon, killed four guys. Who was controlling the aircraft? Just it was an Air National Guard pilot who decided to drop on his own. He decided to drop on his own. It's fucking. Wow. It's a crazy story, man. Like it's it's pretty negligent. I think he was criminally like he was. That held, is extremely negligent. You it, have to have a ground controller to do that shit. So they, if I understand the story, these two guys um, were probably twenty five plus thousand feet. Yeah, I think they were doing an administrative transit back from a combat air patrol. I think they had their nav lights on and everything, and they saw. Uh, like a 240 machine gun position and some Carl G's firing on the range. And by that, you, they were looking through their sensors. There's no way they're seeing that naked eye from 20K. Uh, anyway, the one guy, he's like, we're getting hit. And his wingman's like, no, we're not. And he's like, yeah, we are. I'm, I'm, I'm rolling into attack. And literally, like, they were clear of the space. And dude just rolled in and, and dropped a 500-pound dropped a GBU. Um, oh, that is so unfortunate. And so, you know, long story short... In, in very short order, that task came to my platoon. Uh, we kind of missed all the, you know, all the, you know, the follow on with what happened with that, with that fratricide. And we ended up doing security for this camp. And that was a really profound turning point. Cause it was like, if I ever thought I wanted to be in special operations before. You got a good look at the tip of the spear. And it was so, it, it, 
I, I was the guy that grew up kind of like reading books and like kind of like enamored with the almost like the romanticism of Sof. And and now here we were in an in a camp that's so fucking small that like we're sitting in the O groups of these guys. And we're so remote that like the American unit that's working there would be like, hey, do you guys think if we gave you some trucks, you could like punch out and like secure a couple of key intersections so we could run a gauntlet back? And we're like, fuck yeah. So we went out as like QRFs for these guys. It was like, I just had a complete heart on for this. I say for those of you just listening... He made a very big, strong dick motion. Big, strong dick. And and I came <laughs> home from that tour, and I was like, as soon as I'm available to meet the criteria and the to to apply for selection to our to our unit, I'm doing it. And I I did what it. And is I was the criteria. I think it was, I think it was three years in like full MOC. At that time, you I can't remember if you needed. We weren't deploying that much. I think it was uh, a pre-screening, like a pre-selection. Um, you had to be in rank and in trade for a certain amount of time. Um, and I had literally to the day, I think it was three years. I put my application in, I was screened successful and then did, did selection and, uh, and then our OTC. And I was fortunate enough to be, to be successful in my first go around. Is it a similar or exactly the same experience for officer and enlisted? A hundred percent the same. Good. Yeah, hundred percent. It's the same on our side as well. Yeah, and that's it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about selection. That's yeah. that's something we hold we hold very near and dear People to the can community. Go on the internet and find those answers. You can and and uh, but no, there's that's for us. That's kind of the the Cadbury Cadbury caramel secret for us. It's just not something we talk about, but it is one hundred percent the same. Um, and we actually have a really there's culturally, I think there's a pretty good like cohesion between officer NCO enlisted culture at the unit. If you keep the pipeline and the entry as close to identical as possible, I think it really helps build that. It, yeah. In communities where the uh, there's a very distinct career path selection crucible for the enlisted, and then other people start ballooning in and out, and they come in for phases. Yeah. It's it almost it almost by design creates this grading that manifests itself much much later. Through you're, like resentment, you're and not people, setting yeah. you're not setting the officer up for success by any stretch in doing that. Yeah, like it's hard enough. That job can be hard enough. Like it's, I mean, it, it's pretty intimidating going in as a a new troop commander. Like it's it's a pretty daunting task. Like uh, it's pretty. It, it's a, I mean, from it's a, the enlisted side, when I went through our selection, it's a daunting and intimidating task just going in as a new guy. Period. Yeah, like I can I can remember. <laughs> I laugh because I'm like, oh man, if I could go back in time and like redo my troop command time, <laughs> the shit I would do differently. I must, if I could like, if I could have had like a GoPro on the wall of probably some of the things I said or how I, was, oh, yeah. I would just be like, oh my God, what was I doing? And, and, you know, I've often thought as I kind of have reflected on, I'm like, I went to the unit very young. Um, it, it was not a bad thing, but I also was pretty stupid. Like I probably would have benefited from a few more years of, of just maturity. Like we had a really strong cohort of officers the year I went through. Um, and the, the, the squadron I went to, you know, I went there with, with this, the, the officer who's now the commanding general of, of the whole force and the deputy commander of the whole force. Not to say that I would have been a gofo or a general officer. <laughs> I, I was pretty good at stepping on my dick, but, um, those guys were very senior to me. Like they were probably 10 or 12 year captains at selection. And I was like a three year captain. So like I, I probably would have benefited from a little bit more maturity. When did you start deploying with the unit? I was on Roto zero, like right away, like within, Shit. within, uh, within a month of being badged, I was deployed. And what was the, uh, operational cycle back then? Uh, we, I finished in 2004. Uh, our, our process took about 14 months from sort of, by the time we did our, you know, day one selection, which I mean, kind of equated to maybe like a hell week. It's a, yeah. it's a very specific process designed to, to, to determine a few things about a guy. And then we enter like our OTC pipeline, which would be like our green team. Yep. Um, that's probably about a 14 month process all in all. Um, and, and the deployment cycle at that time 
was was really up in the air because Canada was uh, really at the strategic level trying to figure out what they were going to do with Afghanistan. And so it wasn't, there wasn't really an immediate cycle. I ended up deploying uh, into Afghanistan to do a, a very specific mission on the security side before we had a, before we had a task force there. Um, that was just a short duration stint and that's what I did right away. And it was really, uh, one of the senior enlisted guys said, uh, he's coming to our troop. Um, give this, put him in a turret, give him, give him a gun, just get him deployed. Yeah. Not in a command position, but just get him out with the guys to get some experience. It's just a, a dirt on your uniform. And, and I, and I wish, I wish, and we wanted to do this, but we just didn't have the capacity of guys. I wish we could have officers could have done a year in a, in a team, like in, in the debt, in the stack to really just be, learn, eat, sleep, and breathe the role of, of the enlisted guys. Just to learn how the sausage is made. Learn how the sausage. And I, I was lucky. I got about three months of that. And in that I got a deployment and then we got another deployment into, uh, into Lebanon actually during the second Israeli Hezbollah war, which was kind of cool to kind of see that. Um, so we were there doing support to a non-combatant evacuation operation. Um, Canada has a huge Lebanese diaspora. And so that was, that was pretty cool experience. And then that was the same time that Canada made the decision strategically to put a brigade group into Kandahar and own Kandahar province as a Canadian AO. And then we got the task to go in as a full up combat task force, before we put our conventional troops in and it was just like here's your jpel target lists yes never ending it was it was uh, it was awesome it was like supreme freedom maneuver it was pre ied you know ieds probably didn't really kick in there till about not until the conventional guys got there starting rolling around in big vehicles yeah. so we had a, we had a ton actually it was on the tour that the first ied hit so we had a lot of freedom of maneuver. Um, it was just an awesome, awesome tour. My first, I think, two trips to Afghanistan, Finskin Hilux. Yep. With, I mean, they probably briefed an IED threat, but I don't remember being concerned about it. I, I vividly remember the first one, and it and it did have a big knock on. Uh, it did have a big knock on on just sort of like day to day operations and how kind of guys moved around. It was like, oh fuck, this is. By the time I went back with Team Three in 2010, I wouldn't go anywhere near a road. Yeah. And the first we we were out in uh, Navajar, we stood up a new fob there. We ripped in place. They were co located with the A and or the Afghan National Army and Ash- Afghan National Police. That's where the platoon we ripped with was staying, and then they built like literally laid in the first Hescos and built it up. I think we had a couple RG33s, and I don't remember what we were doing, but and I was in a side by side, a distance away from it. But the first time we took that thing out, yeah, popped it, and then it was like we had to <laughs> sit out there and secure that thing for like 72 hours until an ODA convoy could come drag it back to the base. I felt so I felt bad for the conventional guys Ugh. because I mean we I mean you know like we could choose our time and location. Yeah, we would go at night. We were the pick, route that was the, the most beneficial. We picked our us. route and, 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 you know, maintained control. And I'm a fucking control freak. I think we all kind of are. And these, Imagine being a, and these guys just sitting in the back of a lav or a carrier, just no control, no situational awareness, just kind of waiting. It's, I think it would have been, I, I've got so much respect for those guys because it would have been miserable. Later in that deployment, because um, I was... I had switched over and I was an officer at that point and there was one of the assistant officer in charge. His wife was getting ready to have a baby. So we stayed back for a little bit. So uh, the commanding officer slid me into that slot. Uh, he ended up coming over. The OIC ended up getting fired. They surged another officer over from Iraq. Uh, Nick Norris, the guy who does protect pro- uh, products. Yeah, I've heard his name. He's awesome. He's yeah. as tall as the I chair think- you're sitting in. Slightly shorter, maybe. He'd, he'd have to get another chair to get in that chair, but that's not part of the story. It's just the truth. Um, when they got there, I bumped to uh, the ops officer role, sitting in between two uh, operational platoons, but it was at Mogensen. And Route 1 went right past there. And so there was, of course, you know, the people whose job was to literally have a presence on Route 1. Yep. Sweeping for mines, you know, the cameras that are looking into the culverts and those guys have fucking parts on them, (laughs) bro. I mean, but at the same time, every once in a while, they'd, they'd bury 1500 pounds of HME. Yeah. 
And they would take a V-hold vehicle and invert the V. Yeah. Which, of course, is not survivable for anybody inside. But we're talking, what do you think an RG33 weighs? Thousands of pounds. We had Leopard 2s there. Yeah. And they were cracking the hulls on the Leopard 2s. Some of these charges were throwing RG33s. Yeah. I want to say hundreds of feet. I know at least 100. And we're talking probably, God, oh, I, I may be way it. off in this, but I bet you at least a, getting close to like 20 tons. Yeah. Oh, throwing yeah. them into the air. I, I can remember a couple of the craters. Yeah. Like they're, it but was... you could see it in their faces too. Yeah. Like this is our job and the odds are not in our favor. And I fucking hate everything about my life. I, I could wa- you could almost watch the internal geometry between their ears and, and you could almost see the screws coming loose a little bit. And I, and I, don't blame them for it. I don't blame them at all. And I have mad respect. Oh, God. Like, yeah. mad respect. That's and, not even and the word. You know, like, I don't know what the word is, but it's, I agree with you. I, we, we would get into it, too, amongst, like, our crew. Because we're, like, any time that we thought we had any kind of, like, hardship or risk, we're like, fuck, no way, man. Like, we, yeah, it's dangerous what we're doing, but, like, if we do it well, we can pretty much mitigate a lot of that danger. We... We chose violence, or when we encountered violence, it was almost always on our terms. Yeah, 100%. For those, for those other guys, it was never Always on reactive. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually think, I'm not an expert in post-traumatic stress at all, but I've talked with a fair amount of psychiatrists and psychologists. They call it the locus of control. Yeah. Because we were able to, and it's not like it's some panacea that means it's not going to have an impact on you, but it, it, it changes the way that you process it. If you are choosing... And you know when you're going to encounter violence, you have that locus of control. It is a different experience well, than you're not, somebody who is sitting there You're not like a like, victim. Yeah, correct. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, the, that that's kind of how we rolled. We stayed almost ex- exclusively in Afghanistan until about 2011. Um, but again, partnered with you guys, like with your community, very, very closely with your community. Um, living together, uh, doing joint ops. Yeah, I mean, it's it's chapters of the same book yeah and and the same same guys because it's a small world it's a very small community so like you know the you know we mike talks a lot about extortion 17 and and you know a lot of my friends were very very close with those guys because they did a lot of joint ops together yeah. and um and that hit our community very hard because you know i didn't know many of those guys very well at all but some of my best friends we're very close with them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just, that's another reason why I think I'm here. Like just cause the war stopped doesn't really mean that like cross border stacking up together doesn't need to stop. You know? Yeah. I think well, it's, I think it's important. Those large theaters of war may have wound down, but I don't know. I think at this point, a lot of people realize that we were so good at our job that I think we actually, pushed it, it instead of getting together in large groups it's like well every time we have more than four people on a cell phone together these dudes show up yeah <laughs> so let's not do that and let's not communicate that way and let's spread out to all these different countries yeah. so actually i still think it has happened and it is happening as we're sitting here speaking i'm sure somewhere in, on the globe and i don't think it's ever going to stop it's just it doesn't make the headlines because it's not that mature theater of war with the consistent deployment yeah, and the war now is near peer yeah the whole nature of it is now it's really scary yeah it's uh it's wild and it's not on the battlefield as much for us but it's in but it's very real and i'm seeing that with some of the work i'm doing now why did you decide to get out uh i medically released i got hurt in 2014 uh doing a rehearsal uh and a workup for an op um and i was dumb and i kind of fought through it um, I, we were doing a, a ship underway about 200 nautical miles off the North Atlantic and, and I slipped and fell back going over the, going over the railing around the height of the bridge deck and I fell back into the, into the, the rib we were climbing out of and I hit my head and my back and my hip on the transom and I kind of snapped kind of my whole body. Um, and, uh, I was early into my squadron command time and the smart move would have been to like take a knee and actually heal. But I was like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I wasn't fine. Um, but I was also, so I, I 
that was like the precursor to getting out, but I got out in 2016 and I was, I was ready to go. Um, I had finished my squadron command time. I didn't want to be a careerist. I, and I certainly didn't want to be, um, moving through on someone else's. I would have stayed if I could have stayed at the unit, but I was kind of being pushed out to go get bigger and better experiences and wear polyester uniforms and get a haircut and take a pay cut. And I was just kind of like, I want to be, I want to build my business. And so sort of, I had the right reason to get out medically, but it was the right time. When did you start looking beyond the horizon of the military service? Uh, day one of the military. Um, I, I, I started my businesses while I was still in the unit. Um, I, I more of just like a hobby. I was, I, I, I run an investment fund right now and I built that while I was in the unit. Um, I was always just, I came from a very entrepreneurial family. So I was always just into like the idea of starting businesses. What kind of businesses did your families have? Uh, your family? going way back to my, my, uh, great grandfather, um, outfitted the British expeditionary forces with all the hot chocolate in the first world war. So he ran a chocolate company. Of it, all the things I guessed that you were going to say, yeah, I was like, I I'm need some tell chocolate. you right now that was not what no. I thought you were going to say. A lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, like food importing from historically through my family. My great grand or my grandfather started a company called Double Bubble, which is a bubble gum. Um, and my dad did a lot of import export, started a bunch of Christmas decoration type companies. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, you know, real estate. Uh, and, and in 2005, I came back from my first, or no, 2006, I came back from my first Afghan tour and Canada had just kind of given everybody tax free, which is shocking in Canada with our tax system. So you came back with a little bit of cash tax free while you were overseas, while you're overseas, you're no income tax. Okay. We got paid very well at the unit. We got a lot of uh, danger and hardship and risk. Um, and all of that was tax free. So I came back with a pretty good little chunk of change and I could have bought a pimped out truck or something, but I, I ended up investing in, um, my best friend's self storage company. Uh, and that remains to this day, like probably my biggest investment holding. Um, it's, it's been an awesome investment and I just kind of learned from him as he built a bit of a real estate empire in Canada. And, uh, when I started my company, it was really to just like channel the profits of those investments. And I, I didn't know anything about it. It was incredibly boring. Like, well, like comparatively it, maybe. No, but like it didn't excite me or anything. So I just kind of, you know, align with people that know exactly what the fucking, what the fuck they're talking about and trust them. And, and, and that's what I did in that. And, uh, that was kind of the start of my business. Um, and then when I got out, it was like, Hey, what do I actually know? And it was all this security technology and solving problems and stuff like that. So, yeah, but I, no, I was, I knew from day one, I wasn't going to be a lifer. Yeah. We were, you know, so we're, if people can't figure out where we are right now. Yeah. Wh- we wh- are where are in we? Antarctica. <laughs> I was going to say, you want to talk about where we are? And then I figured there'd be like a, yeah. I asked the fucking questions here. Oh, no, I don't give a shit. <laughs> no, it's I, pretty wild. For the life of me, do you remember the mountain range behind us? The name of it? Yeah. Is it Roswell? Ross? No. It's R- a classic. Like, as soon as I turn my head back and I was going to tell people where we are, I forget the name of the... D- like this, the one that I starts with the like R. Ellsworth? Oh, like the whole range. <coughs> like that range, yeah. I think it's like the L... Yeah, it might be Ellsworth. Listen, There's the Vinson range over there. Listen, people, we've been here for almost a week, and I forgot the goddamn name of the mountain. Behind we, we are we're on the uh, sleep till you're hungry, eat till you're tired routine. And the sun never goes down. But So we have a documentary crew with us, and have, have you done some interviews with I them? I did. I've yeah. done some as well. I had a good and, chat with them yesterday. And then uh, our fearless leader, can do you agree that Mike looks a little bit like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? Can you see it when he ra- when he gets mad yes. and he, when he yes when he does that you can and see ra- it right yeah. <laughs> I think he looks like Donatello the, the, the banter between you and Mike is oh, I fuck fucking up. priceless I fuck it him is, up because is. he's got at most one set of return fire and I've got like several <laughs> rounds fucking loaded up and then finally he his his head starts spinning and he just ah, I'm done here I'm just I'm done I'm on the trip I'm on the trip until. F- and I always fuck with him on the same stuff. Yeah. It's very simple. He doesn't ever tell me shit. 
He doesn't involve me in the planning, and then he just tells me what to do. And and the tumbler. In the well, in the tumbler. But everybody should give him shit for that. But those first three, he keeps doing it. So I'm going to keep giving him shit. Yeah. But anyway, to, to go back to what I was going to ask you, we've done interviews individually, and I'm actually really glad that we had. Has it been six days here? Yeah. Tomorrow will be six. If we didn't have this time to get to know each other better, yep. to sit down with the documentary crew to do the interviews, I, I think we would have struggled in the after because everybody would have gone back to their life. We're in a total comms blackout right now, which I actually really have enjoyed. There was a guy here from Starlink on New Year's Eve. They did a from Mount Vincent, which I believe is the tallest mountain in Antarctica. They yep. did a live stream with this portable Starlink on Instagram, I think, with one of the <clears throat> influencer, influencer guys, guys. that passed through camp. So for a brief period of time, I had a little bit of Starlink and it loaded some emails and all I could see was who it was from and the subject and none of the context would load. Perfect. And I turned it off because I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't want to do this. I want to actually enjoy being here. But we have, I think we have a really good opportunity to gather a lot of the story because once this candle lights tomorrow, it's going to be go. We're like, going to do, I, uh, Nick was just over the other side of the Birmingham game and the thumbs up. So we're going to jump today. Yep. Oh, about, we're jumping today? At about 8 o'clock. Oh. Because we're going to drive. This sh should continue to clear up. It is, yeah, that's four hours from now. Okay. The reason being, we're going to get our flag in the ground. Like we're, we were talking earlier this morning. Are we about, jumping tomorrow too then? We're going to try. We're going to do oh, both. fuck. Because. Sorelli opened, the, opened up a bit. A little bit. Okay. I think it was more in just how it was positioned. You know, we had the meeting this morning and we're talking about the flights that we have scheduled. It's like, guys. We're probably not going to make this if we have any level of complication. <coughs> and so we're, we're setting up all of these mechanisms to make sure that we can make all of our flights. Yep. The one thing we're not giving us ourselves a buffer on is the jump. Here. So we're going to get it, move our flag forward because we have done a practice jump and I'm glad that we did. So we'll you, probably jump tonight around. We think this is going to clear? I mean, we could probably Maybe. hop and pop. We're still, That's we're, what I'm saying. We're, this is literally what you can't see. Just out of the frame is the, the triangular orange uh, wind indicator, which is currently facing 180 degrees in the wrong direction, <laughs> which, which I think we're going to leave and do downwinders tonight. Fuck that. I'll be the first person down, and I will absolutely <laughs> set the pattern for you guys. This much wind actually would help to go into it. Yeah. But we're going we're gonna to bump the flag forward so we can reset the clock because to me the record doesn't matter at all but let's be smart and at least give ourselves choices as opposed to being put into the corner well if something happened tomorrow we'd be fucked we wouldn't actually be fucked because we're already on the clock right now if we wanted to be oh, God, we would right, just be nowhere right. near the, got the seven days got it got the goal it. but again at the end of the day it's not about the jump it's about the awareness and the fundraising but we did a you know so we've done some interviews and then i would describe a really awkwardly facilitated conversation about suicide. <laughs> Mike's like, hey guys, just, and I'm being facetious when I say this, because I'm sure he'll watch this and get super pissed at me, but like, hey guys, just like bring it together. We're going to have a meeting and get the two cameras set up. So, uh, yeah, what do you guys think about your friends killing themselves? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that blunt. I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> it wasn't that blunt. I mean, I'm, you're laughing at how it I'm was laughing. set up. It was, it was kind of out of left field. Yeah. It wasn't that blunt. But it also wasn't that much sharper. And people were pretty uh, yeah. resistant to the idea. And I, and I don't blame them because they didn't have any time to really even yeah. kind of think through what they were going to say. But I don't remember if it was during or it was after you and I were talking. And I was talking about how much time I've spent about thinking about people who have made that decision. And yep. I, I just can't rationally understand that unrational decision. And you from across the room said, yeah, I can. Yeah. And if, I mean, if you're comfortable with it, I would love for you to unpack that a little bit. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, it's a heavy topic. Um, I think everybody, and I've, I've, I've learned this and I'm seeing it with our dynamic here. I know from, from my friends, we all carry trauma, like some pretty fucking heavy trauma. It would be impossible not to, unless Jeffrey Dahmer and I, I don't know if Jeffrey Dahmer would be the case. What I'm saying is a sociopath, of which there have been a few in the SEAL community. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it's, it's the saying I always go back to. If you touch war, it touches you back. The, the other thing that I've learned, I think, and I'm not a, an expert on this at all, uh, but I've done, because of my, like I left ultimately with a pretty significant brain injury. And I was just kind of released with no real support structure. 
and and I didn't know anything about brain injuries. And I spiraled in 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 a couple of ways that really fucked my life up a bit. And in some of those sort of episodes and, and the way that I was living my life and decisions I was making, I was like retreating to this comfort zone of chaos. And the units that we were in were often really chaotic. We were doing fucked up shit, but that was really normal. And all of a sudden, like being at home with my wife and my two kids who were perfect and like life is great and everything looks perfect. I'm like it, that was uncomfortable to me. So I would retreat to chaos. And, and a, an example is like, I have two beautiful daughters, two like the most gorgeous blonde haired girls ever. I took them trick or treating and they were dressed as shimmer and shine, uh, to like Disney fairies or something. They're super cute. Um, brought them home, tucked them into bed, went downtown to a bar and met a buddy, got blackout drive drunk, and then found a gang and got in a f- gang fight with a Somali gang in Ottawa. Uh, that doesn't sound like a good call. And they put me in the hospital. Um, they, But I was just, I was like, I need, to, I need something to go kind of fucked up here. The normal guy would have like put his two fairy dressed Halloween trick or treating kids to bed and then been like, that was a great Halloween. Had three fingers of maple syrup and shut it down. That's it. And my wife, I didn't get through to her. She ended up coming to the hospital because I learned if you go to the hospital drunk, they, they just put you in the fucking corner for like 14 hours. So it was, it was about 14 hours before they stitched up my head. Uh, cause these guys were just smashing bottles on me and stuff. And, and, and I just needed that like chaos and I didn't realize it at the time, but, but these kinds of things were normal. Um, and, and again, throughout this process, I was like, I'm kind of fucked. And I was never suicidal. And I can say that like, honestly, but I got myself sometimes into a position where I was like, I'm not in a good headspace. I could see how someone in not in a good headspace could very rapidly deteriorate. And so that was a, that was like a really holy shit moment that, Hey, everybody, everybody in that's in this kind of predicament, despite what you're dealing with. And, and my life was good. Like for, I was healthy. I, I didn't have a ton of financial stress. Um, my marriage was good. I have two healthy kids. Like the external stress in my life at the time wasn't that heavy. But if, if one of those things was heavy, that just compounds and compounds. And then you add on something like a brain injury, which most of the people in our community have to some degree on the spectrum of brain injury. You're already not playing with a full deck. And Mike introduced me to an amazing uh, clinical psychologist from the U.S. soft community, a guy named Chris Free who you got to chat with this guy. He's unbelievable. And he coined the whole concept of operator syndrome and operator syndrome is very specifically sort of the, uh, comorbidity of injuries that guys in our communities have usually predicated by a head injury and, and then an understanding of what actually like physiologically happens in your body when you get your bell rung. And you know, the first is your sleep gets fucked up your uh, endocrine system completely dysfunctions. So the drug store in your brain starts like giving you all kinds of different drugs at different times and it makes no sense, but you don't know that it's often predicated with low testosterone. So here you're this fucking guy who now somehow is like going to overcompensate for feeling like emasculated because you don't feel the same way you used to. You're in fucking pain because you've had five surgeries and, 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 and you're starting to drink and, and, and you get to the point where it's like, this is fucking bad. And that's where in that conversation, I'm like, Oh, I totally get why someone could do that. Um, and, and if without having a network or an ability to see it for themselves or some kind of other outlet. I think it's very reasonable to understand how and why someone could spiral so quickly, even if things are seemingly 
good on the, on the surface. And it, it, it scared the shit out of me. Um, because irrational thought became rational. And that I think is, and that I think is a, a really hard thing to recognize. But when I started talking to this guy, Chris, this doc, and I read his paper and I started to understand what was actually happening. I'm like, first of all, I'm like, oh, I'm not a fucking, there's nothing wrong. Like this is normal. And then the second I showed it to my buddies, they're like, dude, I'm in the exact same boat. Hmm. And every single guy I've talked to, to some degree on that spectrum is in the same boat. And that w it was like an incredibly comforting, uh, position for me to understand. I'm like, I'm not alone. Like, e like every single guy, the toughest fucking guys that I've ever worked with have probably broken down in tears to me now because I kind of came to this realization. I understood things myself. I'm trying to, we have a, we have a couch in my office at work and it's, uh, it looks like a therapy couch and it's right beside our scotch bar and our coffee bar. Um, and we have a constant open door policy with guys from the unit. Just come on in, hang out at the office, put your feet up. It's rare that a guy doesn't come by, put his feet up, have a cup of coffee, and then get something off his chest that's important to get off his chest. And I think that's the really, I think that's the really important part of that discussion is... It's cool that you feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. Well, vulnerability, I think collectively guys like us have gotten smarter about vulnerability and what used to be perceived as weakness is now actually a, a, a pretty big strength. Yeah. And so I think it's pretty a pretty good sign of strength to be able to be a bit vulnerable. I mean, there's degrees, but like, I think it's I think it's being you know widely accepted to have a little bit of vulnerability, and that's actually like a sign of strength, not weakness. But here we are, like fucking macho guy, like dude. No, it's okay to talk about your feelings. Yeah, I mean, you can pretend not to have them, or you can pretend that they don't impact you. What I think you're doing is just gift wrapping them for later and you have to unwrap that at some point. 100%. Or you just get, you get, you know, you wrap it up, you put a little box and you just put another one and another one and another one. And the next thing you know, it's just an avalanche on top of you. The, the, the other thing that I learned, and it, I don't know what the solution is, and I don't know how it plays out in the U.S., but this is like Chris's mission with his operator syndrome discussion, is the fact that like every ailment that someone is feeling is treated individually as a standalone problem. Interesting. And, and you don't think that like, like for me, I had four surgeries to repair my hips and back. Those surgeries, I'm in pain. I don't sleep because I'm in pain. Now I'm not sleeping. Now my sleep's impacted. I have a brain injury. I had six beers. Like, it, it's all very interconnected. Yeah. Oh, and your endocrine system is like, you know, giving you like bad drugs, Yeah. you know? And, and so each one, you need, you got mental health issues, go see the head shrinker. You got knee and shoulder and go see the orthopedic. You got sleep problems, go to the sleep clinic. But there's like, there needs to be a more like connected holistic approach because individually those specialists don't understand that guys like us with our experiences are coming out of it with like, pretty messy interconnected web of like ailments. I do think they are interconnected and I certainly think they can compound to the point where for some people very quietly, they fucking get to a place where yeah, the irrational and unreasonable somehow becomes the choice of the day or it, hour or minute or second. And that's maybe all it takes. And it's really fucking scary. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the fund you manage. Yeah, I run a venture capital fund. I'm one of one in Canada. We uh, are a, invest in early stage security technologies that are dual use. Well, what's it called? Uh, the, the fund is called One Nine Special Mission Fund One. We're raising fifty million dollars. Uh, we've made uh, four investments already, two of the, mostly into American companies. Um, we like to invest alongside strategic investors, and even though we're new and small. We find ourselves being invited into deals with some pretty, pretty heavy hitting investors. Uh, so our network is solid. Um, as end users in, of national security technologies, 
a lot of the time founders like us because we get it. We can look at something and be like, yeah, it's fucking not well, going to work. The real world like, litmus test. Not, not going to work. Or we have the network where we'll take it to the guys that are still in that business, whether it's on the intelligence Let side. Let them test it. And be like, I mean, if you get something past, I mean, you know, your, your community, the guys are probably the biggest critics in the world. If you get, if you get consensus of the guys saying, Hey, this is a good piece of kit. I like this. That's, it's got some legs. It's got some legs. Um, so we're able to validate early stage before we make an investment. Uh, I I co-run the business, um, with a buddy of mine, Daniel, who founded a, a massive company called Shopify. Uh, so he brings a ton of experience on how to build and grow companies and scale companies. So we've got a, we've got a good team. Um, one of our, one of the, one of the portfolio investments we made is sponsored the triple seven, which is awesome. I'm pretty proud to be flying the canopy of Ventus respiratory, which we think is going to save a lot of lives uh, in soldiers um, by, by giving a new level of personal protection against lung cancers, which is an epidemic unto itself from the whole burn pit and heavy metal exposure that yeah. we all experience. Gun range, lead exposure, kill house. Yeah. So we we're we're seeing a lot of signal that that's, that's a new area. Um, we're building technologies into that to make military tech wearables that integrate with a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, that's, that's the fund. We're a Canadian fund in us dollars. Um, like I said, a lot of our investments are into American companies. Um, how big you want to make it? How far do you want to take it? I want to take it far. I want to be as big as I can with assets under management with as minimal people as I can. Cause I don't want to have to deal with the HR aspect of growing my own company. So I don't know, uh, 500 million, 800 million would be a great, a great goal. I've got some great capital partners that actually know what the fuck they're doing with managing that type of cash. I feel like that could probably help. That helps. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> yeah. Going, going um, on to YouTube. How do you manage <laughs> 200 million? How do, man- how do you deploy 200 million? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's crazy to even have those kinds of conversations because that's just like fictitious amount of money. But in that business, it's kind of not, you know, like yeah, it's the, it, it, a figure much smaller than that. It stops making sense. Yeah. It, but in, in this, I mean, this place has been crazy. Like Antarctica is kind of like a billionaire's playground. Like it, we, we came across a couple, there's a couple of billionaires cruising around the guys that they took off. They went up to Elon Musk's camp. I don't know what, maybe 20 or 30 miles over the mountains. So, yeah. They're living at like some resort camp up there. It's pretty cool. But yeah, it's the, the barrier to get here. You need cash to get here. And there's, there's been a lot of interesting connections that have happened from being here. What do you think about the expedition so far? Love it. I haven't laughed this hard. I, I think we're, I think we're on pace. I think it's a, it, I think it's an ambitious goal and I, I don't know, call me, I don't know, spiritual or something, but I think the reason why we're doing it, honoring honoring fallen friends. Um, the world works in mysterious ways. And I think the powers that be are going to align the hurdles we need to jump through. And I think, I think, uh, that energy and the power of what we're honoring will help smooth the logistical potential obstacles that are probably going to be the hard part. Yeah. I think that's where we're going to encounter the challenge. It's going to be, my biggest fear is a, an aircraft mechanical en route to one of these other locations. Yeah. Especially if it's in an, in an international flight because there's often only one per night. There shouldn't be weather issues. So aircraft mechanical. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You feel that temperature drop? It just dropped. Like 5 to 10 degrees. So... You think we're going to get a jump off tonight? I we get four hours. What I mean, do you I think, think the ceiling is right now? Like, could we hop and pop this? I, I could, but I don't think the tandem could. I don't think the light... I don't want to land... Like, They'll throw smoke out. What's the worst that could happen? Smash that berm. Yeah, but you know it's there. You just don't know where it is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's half just, the battle. If you can't, it, it's hard to see, but there is, it is probably the most flat light right now. It's you crazy. Can't, you can't see any contour in the snow whatsoever. So, last question. I'll close it up so we don't freeze to death. Yes, um, it did drop. It really did. Yep. So Mike and I founded Legacy Expeditions so we can continue to do a bunch of stuff like this. And it's something... The name of that company has got me kicking around things in my own head. And my question for you is, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we're like we're all, we're all going to get there at some point. What do you want your legacy to be? I think it's probably cliche, but I want my legacy to live through my kids. 
Um, I have two daughters, 11 and eight. Uh, and I, I, I want them to uh, know their dad. I want them to look up to their dad. I want to, I kind of want to go out of here with the idea that just he was kind of a good guy. Um, do right by people. Um, you know, show up for people, show up for the world in a, in a positive way. Um, and I think, you know, without like being all like fucking kumbaya, but just like try and do right by people. And, and if my daughters and my wife can be like, he's a good, he's a good dude. Um, and he was there when we needed him. I think I did it right. Yeah. I think that's awesome. This was great. Yeah, it's perfect. We'll we'll grab another one maybe at the uh, at the end on so the we tail end when we're just like drooling, fucking well, shattered. That's the crazy thing is, you know, <laughs> so we've been on the road. I left, I think, the 29th. Yeah, I left the 29th. Today is the eighth. Eighth. And the reality is, yes, we have a practice jump in or the first jump. That's the beauty of we got it in when we could because the weather was fantastic. But we're actually just about to start. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like this the, is all the race, preamble. Race starts either tonight or tomorrow. Yeah. Really tomorrow when the race starts. It's easy to forget that everything that we've done up to this point is truly preamble. Yeah. And we're about to go first to third to fifth. And it'll be long and slow, but at the end of it, it'll fucking go by in a blink, I think. In yeah. the moment, it'll feel like it's dragging, but it'll go by pretty quick. We'll be in, we'll be in Perth before we know it. Yep. And uh, I can't fucking wait flight i'm looking forward to the least is that sydney to lax oh that's gonna be long i think it's 16 hours i think so but we have to go perth sydney sydney lax lax austin then tampa yeah yeah pack of lunch pack of fucking lunch hell yeah until next time all right Thanks, man.